Greetings, unsettled souls, and welcome to The Correct Views. Sam I.B. reporting for The Media Speaks. Make sure you go to TheMediaSpeaks.com. Um, I, guys, went out, spent a small fortune on a really nice HD streaming camera. So for those of you, hi Cindy, that for some reason were tuned in to the low-def version instead of... Right, here's how it happens, friends. I post the webcam version immediately because it's live. Hello, my live friends who are watching. It's the show is done live on the Media Speaks. Those post immediately, and then for all the graphics and the music and all, well, the gra some of the graphics are here, but the music and all that and all the sound effects that come in are things that I do in post production on a really, really nice uh, Panasonic camera. So that's why there's two versions that go up. But anyway, my low-def people should really be able to see the graphics and all of that, which is good. Uh, I put a lot of thought into them, especially when I make them and or choose them. And I've chosen this one. District judge strikes down NYPD stop and frisk as unconstitutional. Bloomberg vows to appeal the decision. Bloomberg is one of the worst Americans I've ever seen in office, uh, uh, you know, except for maybe a few of the presidents. Uh, this guy is abysmal. He would have been perfect in the Soviet Union uh, Russia days. He'd have been perfect. Uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, New York has been, for the better part of a decade now, maybe even over, uh, stopping people on the street, even if they don't suspect them of any crime, just to make sure they're not going to commit a crime. And, uh, of course, that's, that's it. Everything antithetical to what the United States of America is supposed to be. So uh, with that in mind, we're going to go ahead and get into this story. It's from Infowars.com. New York City's stop and frisk policy was, and I will add thankfully, declared unconstitutional today by a U.S. District Court judge who ruled that the practice of stopping and questioning and searching pedestrians violated key provisions of the Constitution. Under the program, New York Police Department officers were allowed to engage people that they deemed suspicious, many of whom research found were merely innocent citizens minding their own business. The 198-page judge's decision found that 80% of people stopped were disappropriately Latino, black, and only 6% stops resulted in an arrest, while staggering 88% of victims stopped were released without further law enforcement action. Now see, I understand, and it, unfortunately is a sad fact of reality, that most crimes are in fact committed by African Americans in terms of the people that are caught with you know, violent crimes of the nature that they think that they're stopping. That does not justify stopping the vast majority of perfectly innocent black people because they happen to be black. I was actually on Zimmerman's side during the trial, as many of you know, who saw the video, go on my channel, it's still posted, passing time, search Zimmerman. I am in favor of every minority who has been stopped with this. You were discriminated against, and that is exactly what I think happened. But it's bigger than that, because they're going after all of us. The Fourth Amendment is supposed to apply to everybody, black, white, or in between. The decision also gave various testimonies from people who were unconstitutionally stopped and frisked, and instances in which officers failed to state a specific suspected crime, the percentage which rose from 1% in 2004 to 36% in 2009. Um, listen to this. This is awful. People have a right to walk down the street without being targeted by police, by police. But people also have a right to walk down the street without being killed or mugged, the mayor said. And that is why, Mr. Mayor, if you would do things in your, in your uh, city, such as uh, work towards marijuana decriminalization, that one act alone would put a lot of nonviolent people on the street, and you would have more room in your jails for the violent criminals that inevitably will be in any society, and you can keep them locked up longer. That is the solution. That is the correct view, by the way. Not targeting people for stop and frisk as they walk down the street. Um, friends, 
I'm gonna go ahead and get to, you know, everyone says how dangerous cities are. Big cities are just so dangerous. Well, friends, that might not be the case. And I'm gonna go ahead and uh, call up here a picture of the Big Apple for everyone. There we go. Now, death trap, right? Guaranteed to be a death trap. Don't live there, you're gonna die. Cities safer than royal areas when it comes to injury-related deaths, say the study by Roxanne Palmer. This is ibtimes.com. Um, and this is interesting. First of all, we have, as we know, violent crime plummeting, going down, down, down. Violent crime rose a little. Uh, it looks like it's going to rise this year a little. But within the last 10 years, we're still much lower than we were. And we remain low. Let it be pointed out here that now that your uh, you're, you're your chances of being violently attacked in cities is going down, why don't we go ahead and address the fact that if you happen to be injured um, and you're not near a hospital, we have people dropping like flies because, you know, we're, we're prepped, we're living in the country. Well, yeah, well, you're nowhere near a damn hospital either. Um, my, I know that my, uh, my girlfriend's mother has uh, a, a thing where she'll be life flighted. That's great. I mean, she lives in Bufu. you got to do something like that if you live there. Because, let's face it, your chances of being hurt in a big city have never been lower than they are now. This is particularly true unless you're, uh, unless you're talking about places like Chicago, which has created violence by uh, enacting gun laws. Um, other than them, it's going down in most cities. Um, the concrete jungle, it says, is actually safer than you may think. A new study of hospital data finds that you are much less likely to die from an injury in the city than in the country. That's true. Uh, and on a smaller scale, I cut the tip of my finger off on a broken aquarium December 5th. Drove myself to uh, the hospital, which is right down the street. And wouldn't you know, I still have my fingertip. They sewed it back on. If I lived in Bufu, that would have never happened. Um, in a study forthcoming in the Annals of Emergency Medicine, University of Pennsylvania researchers Sage Mayers and colleagues analyzed 1.3 million injury deaths that occurred between 99 and 06. Most of these victims were under 45 and lived in urban areas, suggesting that it's more dangerous to live in the city. But when the researchers looked a little closer at the proportion of the urbanites and country dwellers, a surprising trend emerged. In urban areas, a person's risk of injury-related death was about 20% lower than the same risk faced by their country cousins. And that's what happens when you move yourself so far away from uh, uh, any help that when you do have some kind of an issue, you're, you're immediately done. Um, it says, when, numbers broke, when scientists broke the numbers down by demographic factors, other patterns emerged. Royal countries, royal counties, excuse me, populated mostly by black people were much safer than royal counties with the lowest percentage of black residents. Injury-related fatality rates were virtually the same in both heavily white and heavily black urban areas. I do hate when they break everything down to color because it means nothing. Uh, friends, Natural Society, new research, the average person is exposed to cancerous levels of toxins. For you top 40 Usher fans, that means uh, cancer. You're going to get cancer, and there's levels of things that cause it in vast abundance in your body. And here we go. Natural Society says we know that there are toxins in our food. These toxins, toxins exist in varying levels and come from sources... Let me get rid of this picture because it's probably confusing at this point. The research comes from the University of California. It says they exist in varying levels and come from sources like pesticides, soil contaminations, and even the seeds themselves. We can minimize our exposure to these toxins by eating organic and growing our own foods. Now, I'm going to stop for one second. This, this is a huge problem that you never hear addressed. Yours truly would love to eat all organic. I would also like to be a millionaire, which is the only way that someone can afford to do so. Part of the problem is the organic food sellers. They are charging insane amounts of money for their produce. And, and pretty much all organic things, actually. So when you hear you should eat all organic, you should also be a millionaire. They are part of the problem. I'm going to go on. But we are still being exposed at one level or another. A recent frightening study indicates even the average person 
is being exposed to cancerous levels of toxins like arsenic, dioxins, and DDE. The research comes, like I said, from the University of California, Davis, where scientists looked at the diets and related toxin levels in 364 children between the ages of 2 and... It doesn't say what the other number is. That's funny. And 7,000... Okay, I'm sorry. It's, it's worded badly. 364 children between the ages of 2 and 7,446 parents of young children and 149 older adult, adults. How badly can one sentence be worded? Uh, what they found was not only troubling, but truly scary. Um, using dietary surveys and toxin content, content data sets, the scientists were able to determine an estimated toxin level and compare this to the cancer benchmark of each compound. The cancer benchmark, it goes on, is a term used to describe the exposure level that one would generate one, ex would generate one excess cancer per one million people over a 70-year lifetime, according to Natural News. All right, guys, here's what they found. Arsenic, found mostly in poultry, cereal, salmon, tuna, and mushrooms. Uh, tuna and mushrooms after Fukushima, do, if you're eating either one of those, you might as well just blow your head off because you're already juicing yourself. They are radiated because the tuna uh, coming out of the Pacific Ocean is absolutely poison. And the mushrooms, they, they, they grab uh, nuclear elements. So just don't eat those anyway. Um, DDE uh, found in dairy, potatoes, meat, freshwater fish, and pizza. Freshwater fish being particularly disturbing since already Fukushima has ruined the ocean. Um, Dedrin, dietary meat, cucumber, cantaloupe, pizza. So even a cantaloupe isn't safe, that's awful. Uh, chlordane, uh, dairy, cucumber, meat, popcorn, and potatoes. Dioxins, dairy, which again, affected by Fukushima in great numbers. Meat, potatoes, cereal, and again, mushrooms. Mushrooms that I used to love, I never eat anymore. Um, acrylamide, crackers, fried potatoes, cereal, graham crackers, and chips. It says going organic, if you're a billionaire, and giving up processed foods, if you're a billionaire, is the best way to steer clear of these foods and know with reasonable certainty what you are putting into your body. Yet with somebody, and I'm a fan by and large, but someone needs to tell the natural society here that not everyone can afford to do that. Boneheads! Um, the Bud Cake Catalog. Make sure you get it. Go to TheMediaSpeaks.com, click on Bud K. You do it that way, you help The Media Speaks. We keep getting money in, and we can keep doing what we do. We can do it better, and we can do it more efficiently with, with better gear when you help us. And one way to do it is by going to the Bud K catalog. Uh, this is great. They've got really interesting things here. Cobra self-cocking cocking, tactical crossbow pistol, 80 pounds, $39.99. They're practically giving it away. Um, Life Straw Personal Water Filter, 1999. You can pretty much drink anything within reason, and that that Life Straw goes ahead and makes it uh, makes it, it's a survival item. It's exactly what you need to survive. And again, you're looking for just a little bit of fun. All right, fine. The M48 Commando Survivor Training Hamel Tactical Hiking Staff, 84.99. Um, does everything but your laundry. Uh, go camping this summer. Go out, have some fun, enjoy yourself. Go to Bud K's uh, by going to TheMediaSpeaks.com. Click on the Bud K ad and know that you're helping us and that we appreciate it. We can keep these things going. The Media Speaks. All right, guys, I'm going to get two more stories for you. Metadata can tell the government more about you than the content of your phone calls. You know how, um, again, this is Washington's blog, you know how... The government is saying, we're only taking your metadata, not the actual content of your conversations. Well, actually, that is untrue. They are taking the content of your conversations. But um, let's get into this idea of metadata a little bit. The government has thought to reassure us that it is only tracking metadata, such as the time and place that the phone calls were made, and not the actual content of the calls. But technology experts say that metadata can be more revealing than the content of your actual phone calls. For example, the ACLA, ACLU notes a Massachusetts Institute of Technology study a few years back found that reviewing people's social networking contacts alone was sufficient to determine their sexual orientation. 
Consider metadata from email communications was sufficient to identify the mistress of then CIA director David Petraeus and then drive him from office. They also went into his email account, spied on him illegally, looked in the draft folder to find it. They had a fake email set up, and rather than send emails to each other, Petraeus and his lover would just leave drafts in the inactive email account, and it was still gotten into. So they are taking more than they say, by the way. The who and the when and how frequently of communications it goes on are often more revealing than what was said or written. Calls between a reporter and a government whistleblower, for example, may reveal a relationship that can be incriminating all of its own, and now you've found a new way to stop the press. Now, haven't you? Freedom of speech. Repeated calls to Alcoholics Anonymous, hotlines for gay teens, abortion clinics, and a gambling bookie may well tell you what you need to know about a person's problems. If a politician were revealed to have repeatedly called a phone sex hotline after 2 a.m., no one would need to know what was said on the call before drawing conclusions. In addition, sophisticated data mining technologies have compounded the privacy implications by allowing the government to analyze terabytes of metadata and reveal far more details about a person's life than ever before. If that does not spell out to you why this metadata thing is so important and important, and you simply have a pumpkin for a head, because there's no other way around it, they can tell what you're doing, or at least they think they can. Let me add that for this show, I've been to Al-Qaeda websites, so I'm According to my metadata, terrorist. See how that's a slippery slope? Well, he does a political show, and he's been to an Al-Qaeda site or ten, uh, looking up stuff, so, you know, hell, he's got to be a terrorist. Arresty! Not you're wrong. That's why they shouldn't be doing it. So here we go. It's some of the other things your metadata can give you. Uh, give them. They know, you're, they know you rang a sex phone service at 2.24 a.m. and spoke for 18 minutes, but they don't know what you talked about. They know you called a suicide prevention hotline from the Golden Gate Bridge, but the topic of the call remains a secret. Only a Kesha fan couldn't figure that out. They know you spoke with an HIV testing service, then your doctor, then your health insurance company in the same hour. They don't know what was discussed. Of course not. They know you received a call from a local NRA office while it was having a campaign against gun legislation, and then called your senators and congressional representatives immediately after the content of those calls remains safe from government intrusion. That sounds safe to me. Uh, last one. They know you called a gynecologist, spoke for a half hour, and then called the local Planned Parenthood's number later that day. But nobody knows what the conversation was about, so you're safe. That, I think, spells out exactly why metadata is way, way uh, not the safe option. Like, this, this notion that we need to know everybody that's had an abortion to catch terrorists is simply uh, insane. Last thing I want to get to, I haven't ended with my science stuff in a while. Shame on me. Um, Foxnews.com, pink alien planet is smallest yet photographed. It's bigger than Jupiter. That's insane. Or as Paul Joseph Watson would say, that's absolutely insane. We love you, Paul. Astronomers have snapped a photo of a pink alien world that's the smallest yet exoplanet found on a star-like sun such as ours. The alien planet JG504b, because they never name anything, maybe if you would name things, you would find that children who are interested in astronomy and things like that, but maybe not hooked on it yet, you might find that they have a much bigger interest in astronomy if you will name them. I know, there's too many to name in theory. I get it. Name them when something like this is found. And you'll find that you, you have the youth attention much quicker. Trust me on this. That's why I'm the correct views. The alien planet is colder and bluer than the astronomers had anticipated, and it likely has a dark magenta hue. Infrared data from the Subaru telescope in Hawaii has revealed. If we could travel to this giant planet, we would see a world still glowing from the heat of its formation with a color reminiscent of a dark cherry blossom, a dull magenta. How do you like the new camera, low deaf people? Uh, Michael McLuhan of NASA's Goodard Space Flight Center in Greenbolt said in a statement from the Space Agency, Our near-infrared camera reveals that its color is much more blue than the other image planets, which may indicate that its atmosphere has fewer clouds. Water 
Water tends to be blue, but no, probably, I, I get it, it's a joke. The exoplanet orbits the bright star J, J, GJ504, which they name that so that children won't become interested in astronomy, which is 57 light years from Earth, slightly hotter than the Sun, and faintly visible to the naked eye in the constellation Virgo. The star system is relatively young, at roughly 160 million years old. For comparison, Earth's system is 4.5 billion years old. Though it is the smallest alien world caught on camera around a sun-like star, the gas planet around it is still huge, about four times the size of Jupiter. It lies in nearly 44 Earth-Sun distances from its central star. Oh, so it's cooking. And it makes it uninhabitable. Yeah, it's 460 degrees. Uh, well, then again, you know, there, there, there are bacteria and things that live in the hottest. There's bacteria that can live in nuclear meltdown fuel water. So, uh, to say that there's no life there, I think, is a bit of a stretch. But it's very unlikely. I'll give it that. So, I mean, yes, it's huge. Um, it's the smallest alien world that is massive, I guess. Um, I, you know, then again, there's, there's gases and things around it. So, you look this up. It's, it's interesting. That's why you're watching. Thanks, friends. It is the Correct Views, Sam I.B. signing out. Make sure you go to the Media Speaks. Look at the work of Kyle Court, D. Lake, and myself. Um, also, make sure you buy something from Bud K. And if you can donate to this show, hit me up at the Correct Views at Hotmail.com. Because all the money that you give to me goes to a better show. The new camera, the new set, the new monitor, all this stuff costs money. And the money you give me is what makes it possible. I thank you for doing so, friends. Go to the Charity Connection and help out Dana Mowgli Christ if you can. She runs it. She herself has lung cancer. Now, she can't save our lives if we don't save hers. Let's get on it. Good night, friends. God bless, and thank you so much for listening.